The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you to, for joining us at VBA Express on part two of our webinar on Excel tables. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. It's great to see so many people here. We hope you enjoy it. The topic today is going to be presented once again by Zach Barisi. If you don't know Zach, he has a long history with us, which dates back to the inception of our site and is one of the co-founders. He's a member of many online Excel forums and has recently authored a book on Excel tables, first of its kind, and is developing a tables add-in. He also likes long walks in the park with his dog, cheeseburgers, and Xbox. Today's webinar is scheduled for one hour. We'll do our best to keep it at that, and we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for any questions. We also don't mind staying on longer if there are more questions. Feel free to type your questions in the chat box as we go along. We'll have someone monitoring them throughout the webinar. For this webinar, we'll be using Excel 2013 to show the examples, although most of it can be used from Excel 2007 through 2013. As a final note, we won't be covering Excel Online or Excel for iPad. And with that, Zach? Hey, uh, thanks, Joe. I uh, appreciate the, the very kind intro. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great to have everyone here. I really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, if you've joined us uh, last week and you've signed up for a second week, uh, a, another boring hour narrated by myself, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry and thank you. Uh, but yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate it. So we've got a lot of stuff to cover today, and I, I know we want to... Uh, reserve some time at the end for questions, but if you do have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat box, and uh, I'll try to get to it um, as they come in. Uh, we've got some notifications. So uh, so with that, basically what some of the things that we're going to cover is, uh, you know, all VBA, all tables uh, for an entire hour. So we're going to bore you out of your minds uh, with, you know, the table objects, uh, you know, members and properties uh, of working with tables. Uh, how to work with parts of a table, you know, showing or hiding, uh, testing uh, if they're there, excuse me, there or not. Uh, we'll look at the macro recorder and really why it fails with tables and probably what I think is probably the biggest reason why people aren't using the, uh, the table objects uh, themselves is because you don't get anything with a macro recorder. So we'll go over that. Um, there, we'll go over some, some basic looping examples. Uh, and then I've got some uh, inserting and deleting routines to go over uh, and how it's not efficient uh, with the built-in methods for the table object members. Uh, and then I've got some a uh, class module uh, to, to show some examples of kind of how to leverage tables with VBA. Now this sample file is available. Uh, Christopher, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe this is available or will be available shortly on the uh, website on BB Express. Is that right? It'll be up there later today. Okay. So this, I'm using the same sample file that, that you all have will have access to. Um, and if you have any questions about it later on, if you're going through it, uh, you know, feel free to, to shoot me an email. Uh, Zach, Z-A-C-K at exceltables.com. I had to keep it stupid simple for me. So, uh, without further ado, I'm just going to jump right into it. So, uh, identifying parts of a table. So, the first thing to know is a table is uh, a list object. That's what we call it. And I'm going to increase my font size in case you can't really see my eight-point font. Okay, so this is a these here are these two top routines. These are very simple routines on uh, showing and hiding the header and total row. So you can see uh, I declare all my variables. I use option explicit. Uh, apologies to uh, Bill Jellen who does not use option explicit. I'm a big fan, so I declare all of my variables with the dim statement. And I like simple names. I probably I've moved away from Hungarian notation just because it's it's. Uh, 
it's not necessarily always applicable, although I do happen to use it for my modules and classes, where I preface all my modules and in classes with, with C, uh, and also in user forms. But, uh, so I've declared this object as, uh, you know, with my name that I just called table, and I've declared it as a list object type. So when, I, when you set it, I'm just set, there's a couple ways to set it. So you can set it with the index number or a textual value. Right, and instead of uh, instead of passing the table name, this is kind of a generic way of just saying grab the first table on the worksheet. And this is good if you only have one table on a worksheet. You always know which one it's going to be. It's going to be number one. If you don't know which table it's going to be because you have multiple tables on a worksheet, it can get tricky. If that's the case, it's always better to use the, the string name, which this one is called data. Uh, which you see from the design tab in the table name area. So I'm just going to copy that and I'll come in here and put it within quotes and that's doing the same thing. Now the list objects object is a member of the worksheet class so um, I'm just prefacing it with active sheet. Now, uh, you, you have to do that otherwise you'll, you'll error it out. Um, from that point once this once your, your variable is set to the list object type, you're going to get uh, the wonderful world of IntelliSense. So as soon as I type table and as soon as I hit period, you get the IntelliSense dropdown that gives you all of the uh, methods and, and properties of the list object. So the, the ones that we're going to focus on are uh, the data body range. Uh, and right now, uh, with this example, is the, the show headers. So I click show. You can see these are all of the items that you can toggle. So there's show totals and show headers, and we're going to look at those two. Uh, not all of these are available in all versions of Excel. So, for, for example, the show auto filter drop down, this one's only available in Excel 2013. So, where you see this member, the show auto filter drop down, is this filter button, which is only available in, in 2013. Uh, it's not in, in 2007 or 2010. Uh, you can use uh, the keyboard shortcuts, or what our Microsoft is now calling keyboard accelerators, uh, which I, I often use for auto filter, Alt D, F, F. And that will toggle the filters on and off. The only downside is it disables the filter button and you can Alt D F F to turn back on, and it re-enables the filter button. I thought that was a bug for the the, the longest time. Uh, I got an answer from Microsoft finally stating that it wasn't a bug because you turn the auto filter off, uh, which means there is no range two filter, so you can't enable it. And that was uh, it wasn't it was a reason. I don't know if it was a great reason, but it was a reason. Uh, so it's it's technically not a bug, uh, although you probably still call it that. So uh, for this example, what I want to do is basically show the headers or not show the headers. I'm just toggling back and forth. So basically here's what I'm saying is since this is a this is a Boolean, uh, all of the, the show members are Boolean true or false. I just say table equals not table dot show headers. So I just I just toggle that that property on and off. And the same with the total row here. So when I run this show headers, you see it's on so it turns it off. When I run it again, it's off and then it turns it on. So you can show different parts uh, of the table and you can also show parts of the formatting such as banded rows, banded columns, first, last column, uh, things like that. So uh, you have uh, column stripes which is the bands table row stripes, which is the banded rows, first column, last column. Uh, the parts of the formatting for the, the table styles with the, such as uh, first header cell, first total cell, those will be toggled on and off if you have that formatted with this first column uh, and the, vice versa with the last column. So they're, they're kind of paired there if you're familiar with the, the table styles that we went through last week uh, shortly. If not, uh, watched the video for last week, and we did cover it uh, slightly. We, I mean, it was only an hour, but uh, they're all they're all kind of tied together there. So, uh, 
this is just the, the first example of using the list object object. So we know it's a table is a list object. We know it's a member of the worksheet class. We know we can reference it either by its uh, textual name or its display name, or by its numerical order, numerical index order that it was created on the worksheet. So it doesn't go top to bottom. It's going to go whichever table was created first in the worksheet, which is a little different than most other members that we're used to dealing with in VBA. And that's because when the table is created, uh, it's it's uh, written into the XML of the file, and uh, and and its its name is in uh, you know table one dot XML. So it doesn't actually contain the the display name of the table. It's just generic names table one dot XML, and inside that the display name has a property that lists. The, the display name. So they're created in order. These XML files are created and destroyed when you create uh, or destroy a table. Uh, okay, so let's see. We got some questions here. Uh, oh, well, thank you, John. <laughs> uh, when this last week's session was over, is there a way to view it online somewhere without a paid subscription? Uh, yep, Christopher answered that question. Uh, there's a video page on vbexpress.com for later. Uh, Excel number of the tables in the order they're created. John, thank you for asking that question. I hope I just answered it. So no, uh, or yes, they, they are numbered in the order they are created, and it's per worksheet. So if I created another table on this and I stuck it above this other table, this is now table two up top. And this is table one at the bottom. So it can be uh, a little confusing when, when trying to, to ascertain a, a, you know, an unknown table on a worksheet with multiple tables. So this is one reason why generally and usually it's a good idea to keep one table per worksheet. Or if you create them, create them in order, usually ascendingly helps it keep it uh, you know, ordered better in your head end with your code or just use uh, you know some kind of common naming structure so you always know the name of it uh, figuring out if a table exists on in a in a file because you don't have one unique table name per workbook right so you can't have two identical table names on different worksheets it doesn't work that way because it's a it names the range globally within that workbook so uh, I've got a routine in here to check if a table name exists. Basically, it's kind of like pivot tables. Uh, you have to basically loop through every worksheet and then loop through every list object on that worksheet, checking the table name. Uh, so it's, if you've worked with pivot tables before in VBA, it's basically the, the same uh, premise, is that you can't have two identical pivot table names on different worksheets within the same workbook. Uh, so here's some examples of uh, turning the formatting on and off. Now, if you don't have this uh, format specific format item in the table style applied, it still won't show up. So this is the row stripes. Uh, so you know this routine: turn off banded rows. You know I declare the the table. My my table is a list object. I set it, and then I say show table style row stripes is not itself. So in other words, toggling that. So if you look on the in the design tab in the table styles gallery, you can see banded rows is checked. If I run that, I hit F5, I don't want cursors anywhere in the uh, the routine, you can see the banded rows comes off. I'll run this again, banded rows comes back. But you, you notice there's no change on the actual worksheet. That's just because the style doesn't actually have a uh, a, a row stripe applied. So if I modify this, this first row stripe is not, you see it's not bolded, so it doesn't have a format applied to it. So if I apply a format or a table style that does have banding in that style, and then I run this routine, you can see it actually has a result that, that actually uh, toggles those banded rows. So you may or may not uh, be have, you know, have any formatting actually applied to that uh, specific element of the table style, 
but you're still toggling it on and off. Uh, so for the drop down for, for 2013 only, like I said, that's the show auto filter drop down. Uh, and then the first column and the last column, you can also toggle those. So they're just showing and hiding uh, parts of a table. Now the the meat and potatoes of, a, of parts of a table is really, like, like we went over last week, it's the header row, the data body range, and the total row, which is not showing on this one, total row. So there's really three parts to the table and working with those. Knowing whether these are visible or not is going to be uh, pretty much pertinent to working with tables, especially when expanding or contracting rows, inserting and deleting rows, uh, resizing, returning queries uh, to a table. Uh, for example, you know, if you connect to like an access database and you have a query that you're going to return, uh, that you want to return to a table, then typically the order is, is basically this. Show the header row, don't show the total row, delete the data body range, instantiate a row, return the query to, to the data body range, uh, you know, cell one one, row one, column one. Uh, the some of the things that could hinder you is from the from the Excel options, which you can get to by clicking File Options. In the proofing, in the autocorrect options, and I apologize, I don't remember if we went over this last week. Uh, there are two settings in the auto format as you type, and that's include new rows and columns in a table and then fill formulas in tables to create calculated columns. Now, why these are in autocorrect options, I have no idea. Uh, it seems mildly retarded for Microsoft to put them in here uh, and not you know, part as part of a, a table. It's, it, they're not even connected to the, the list object, uh, object or its members in any way. It's in the application uh, autocorrect options where these two options are. And you can set these uh, by code uh, as well. So by default, these two are checked, which basically means if you have a, a table with a row here and you paste data in this cell, the table will auto expand as far down as the data goes. So when, for you know, the example of returning data from like a, a database query, if you have, uh, if this is a table and, and, and you have no rows below this, let's say I delete all my rows, and I return a query result here, If these results go down here to you know row 49, then that table is going to to, to auto expand. You can see the the little blue uh, backwards L icon down here in the bottom right corner, which shows that that's the bottom right corner of the table. And then if you want, you can resize. Click the resize table, and you can see the actual range of the table. So uh, everything by default, assuming everything's by default, uh, it's always best to have the header row showing. Uh, toggle the total row off delete the, the data body range, and then return your, your query. So uh, macro recorder. So I do want to talk about how the macro recorder basically fails, uh, epically fails, and falls just flat on its face when it, when it comes to tables, because you don't get anything about the list object when using the macro recorder. And uh, one way that, that I usually um, you know, check out some kind of code that, you know, maybe I don't know the syntax or I don't know the specific object or members that are being used, is use the macro recorder. It's just a nice simple way to to get information about what you're doing. So uh, so I use the, the button here on the bottom. You can go to the developer tab and click record macro. Uh, if the developer tab is not showing, just right click customize ribbon and then just make sure it's, it has a check mark next to it. By default, it won't be checked. So make sure that's showing. Click record macro. I'll call it tables foobar. And I'm just going to say, I'm going to type right next to it. It adds it to the column, my auto fit. I'm going to put in the formula. Since it's a table, it realized it was a formula, the entire column was blank, so it, it entered that as a calculated column, and this is a true calculated column. Stop recording. So now, what did that come up with? So here's where I selected cell I5, which is where that 
that next column header is. It just gives me this active cell formula, you know, row one, column one, R1, C1, you know, equals this text string. And then it, you see it, it gives me the, uses the range object to select that part of the table. So it basically passes a string. Anytime you actually interact with, with parts of a table, uh, the macro record is going to give it as, as part of the range object. And if it recognizes it as a, you know, an actual table part, it's going to pass that uh, as part of a string. Now you can work with this uh, all day long and you can pass the part of the table by string and use the range object all day long if you want. Uh, another way to write this Sorry about that. So that's my phone. Uh, another way to select, now there's no real reason to select anything. I realize that, uh, but this is a good example. Okay, so I declare my, my variable as a list object. I set it. Now I'm going to say table list columns pass the string name of the column and I'll say range select hit F5 and it runs and it does that that same thing okay so we can we can use the list object to to do the same thing that the range object does with the macro recorder so basically the only time we're going to get any type kind of table syntax is when it passes it as a string as part of the range object, which is kind of a pain in the butt. And it's really misleading and I think it will really lead people away from you know using list objects in VBA because the macro recorder just it totally bombs. It doesn't give you any list objects whatsoever. Not in entering, you know, inserting columns, not with deleting, not with auto fitting, not with formulas, not with toggling on and off any of these options, nothing you do with the macro recorder will give you a list object object or its members or properties. So here the formula you can see it just it selected a range and it said active cell which is you know a range object uh, formula R1C1 equals and I did pass the uh, the structured reference in the formula which is good uh, but still you know the important part, the the list object object or its members there are are not referenced whatsoever. So the macro recorder is really kind of you know falls flat on its face when it comes to tables. All right, so we got a question. When you enter the formula in next column, Excel copy the formula down in the column. That step is not part of the recorded macro. How in VB do you tell it to copy the formula down? Great question, John. Um, basically, you you don't. Uh, so there is there is really no connect between entering a formula either in the worksheet or in VBA to making it a true calculated column. So I think I showed everyone last week, but uh, I will show you now. Uh, so I want to make a copy of this. And I'm going to open this up. So if you change the file extension of an Excel file in the new file format, not .xls, but xlsx, xlsm, or xlsb, well, not xlsb, you have to, those are binary files, they, they're a little different. So xlsx or xlsm, uh, even templates, uh, change the file extension to zip, open that zip up, and you have all of the uh, properties. And we go into the Excel folder, and there's a tables subfolder, and here, is what I was talking about, where all the tables of the whole, in the entire workbook are listed in XML. So uh, I want to open this. Uh, can you guys still see my screen? Can you move your mouse? Okay. Yep, we can see it. Okay. Oh, 
Okay. So you see a screen. Okay, everyone should see a blank screen. I've got Notepad++ up right now. Correct. Okay. Okay, so this is what a table looks like in XML. All right, so this is everything that Excel, the, the Excel application writes into its file structure uh, when you create or, or work with a table whatsoever. So you can see uh, the name and the display name are uh, just, just um, properties or, or attributes uh, as part of the table um, node. In, in the XML structure. And then you can also see that it's got a calculated column formula as part of the table column. Uh, so it's a, a calculated column formula is a, a child member of the table column member. And then you can see it, it enters the formula here. Now there's some default actions when this happens when Excel recognizes it as a calculated column. So the first action is it, it puts it here into XML. Then once it once it has a calculated column in XML, it will overwrite every cell in that column to have that formula. Uh, and then there's some, some odd ways how this updates when new rows get added. And it's part of that reason why you don't want to use absolute cell referencing, standard cell referencing, you know, using the dollar signs. Uh, and you want to try and use structured referencing, right, like this has here with the square brackets, uh, because it, it won't always update properly. Another thing that you'll notice about this is uh, the you don't have the the at sign. You have the the square bracket pound this row and square bracket. Now, for any hardcore table users, you probably recognize this from Excel 2007 when this was the syntax used when you uh, when you referenced an adjacent row. Like this, this highlighted reference is the uh, the same the cell in the same row of the units column, and this left reference, this left selected, is the the cell in the same row of the formula being called of the cost column. So this was really confusing, and Microsoft changed this specific reference to the at sign. So now it's just uh, left bracket at at symbol cost right bracket to reference something in the cost column. Now that's how it's written in 2010 and, and 2013. You could write it just like this in 2010 or 13 if you were really hardcore in 2007 with table structured references. Personally, I hate this. It's long, it's confusing, and using the at symbol is much easier. Uh, however, this is how it's written into the XML, and that's how it can be forward and backward compatible when they changed the formula syntax is because it, by default, it always writes in 2007 format to the XML file. So no matter what version you're in, 2007, 10, or, or 13, uh, it'll get written uh, in 2007 format into the XML file. So it, it was, it's actually a pretty ingenious workaround, and I definitely applaud uh, the folks at Microsoft who came up with this. Uh, it's kind of a pain in the butt if you actually want to parse the XML, but it definitely works on the on the worksheet itself. So this is uh, a true calculator column and how it uh, gets written into the XML. So that action, uh, which we don't have control of in VBA, is when you when you enter a formula, uh, it will as long as, long as you have the, that autocorrect option. So this uh, fill formulas in tables to create calculated columns, this is what will uh, automatically expand those formulas. And we don't actually have any control over that besides setting this, this property to true and then adding a formula to the column. Now the way that I would do this in VBA is to say, uh, to say uh, okay, so I'm going to set my table as a list object and list column. Now, list column object includes the entire column uh, of that table. As you can see, when I when I run this, it's going to select everything: the header, the data body range, and the total row it's showing. If I just want the body of that column, I'm going to use this data body range 
uh, member of the list column itself and say formula equals and then just type out what you want um, equals totals times 1.1 right well at 10 percent I'll run that and you can see the values increased uh, and it's got you know, displays going off caddy wampus I'm going to restart my Excel here. My Excel does not uh, does not appreciate uh, any go-to meeting or go-to webinar too much. So you can see the formula in here is updated to what I had, and it updates for every cell in here. So basically, the reason I I do this with the when I enter formula, it's with the list column, and I use the data body range member of that uh, the list columns object, is because it'll overwrite everything in that column and this then since it's formula it gets written into the XML the file where you uh, get in some issues is so I just replaced everything in the data body with text if I said equals total enter nothing gets updated and you get this little button in the bottom right corner it gives you one option that says overwrite all cells in this column with this formula this action writes uh, to the XML that calculated column formula that way. So while you can enter a formula in a single cell in VBA is generally just not a good idea. You want to write the formula to the entire column and that use the data body range of that column. And that way it will you can you know it's going to get written into the uh, XML of the file and it will be a true calculated column. Good question, uh, John. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so uh, so we've gone over why the macro core fails. Uh, some some objects of the the table. I want to go over a few more objects here uh, before I move on. So we talked about the list columns a little bit. Interesting thing about the list columns is you can never remove all of the list columns. There will always at least be one list column in a table, which is different than list rows and the data body range where you can actually delete those and the objects uh, themselves can actually equal nothing. So uh, for an example, uh, let's do this. So I'm going to say, I'm going to delete the data body range of this table, which is good for uh, things like you know clearing it out, such as uh, you know refreshing a uh, a query via VBA that connects to a database. Right? Um, if it's just a straight up data connection, then you can just refresh it, uh, such as like a connection to like a SQL Server. Uh, you can just refresh it. You could you know if you have a connection to like an access table, you can refresh it. A good example is uh, returning like a cross tab query. You know, there's there's almost no native way to do it. Uh, you you know, I realize you can uh, if you use Microsoft Query, uh, which is you know still in here. Uh, it uses um, you know ODBC, which is an older method. It's in here for backwards compatibility reasons. Uh, Microsoft does not recommend it going forward, but it still does work. It's got a really crappy UI and it's really old looking, like it's from uh, you know Excel ninety five. Uh, times, which I think is about when it came on the scene, but um, it, it's still there if you want to use it. I prefer to use VBA for it, uh, and I, I do have uh, some simple files with this, uh, with that as a, an example on uh, exceltables.com. Uh, I believe it's exceltables.com slash book, and if you scroll down to the bottom, all the sample files that we used in the book are available for free download. Uh, I do want to mention that all the sample files are based on two sources. Uh, first is Deborah Dalglish from Contextures.com. She's got some uh, cool sample data, which this table itself is from. And then I used uh, the AdventureWorks 2012 SQL Server database, which is a free download from Microsoft. Um, so all this stuff is, you know, it's freely available. Um, so uh, what I want to do is I want to take the data body range of this table and delete it. 
So I'm going to take this and I'm going to run it. And you can see it deleted the data body range. Now if I run this again without doing any other action, it's going to error out. So I'll run this again. And you can see I get uh, this runtime error 91 object variable or width block variable not set. If I debug, it's on this right here because the data body range actually is nothing. Uh, like when you uh, terminate a, a object or delete a range that you know that referenced range or, or variable is equal to nothing. So uh, the way to get past this is just to say if not table dot data body range is nothing then then delete it. So I'm just going to step through this with F8 and that evaluates when I hover over it you can see the uh, the pop-up that says table dot data body range equal to nothing. So it actually is uh, it's not instantiated yet so it doesn't actually equal anything. So this can be problematic when working with VBA because you, you usually you want to test that. Now, so there's some interesting ways on how to actually instantiate a table, um, which, of course, depends on how you want to do it. You can go, you know, the first uh, cell one one of the header row range. If that's not showing, if the header row is not visible, that object is nothing. So you might have to test for that. Um, usually, what I do if I want to, to instantiate a row, uh, say I if I don't want to delete a table. Uh, so I'll, I'll do my test if it's not there, and I'll say table dot list rows dot add. Now there's some interesting things that go along with this. If I run this, you're not going to see any change on the worksheet. But I'm going to run this. So I run that. I see no change on the worksheet. I'm going to go back to this uh, tables three example here, where I delete the data body range. And here's my test. See if the data body range is not nothing. Oh, and of course, it doesn't work for me now. Uh, here, let's see. Um, oh yeah, because I was testing it was not nothing. Uh, okay, so I'll just put in today's date. Um, okay, there we go. So, uh, so you got rows instantiated. The nice thing about tables is since the calculated columns were written to XML, the formulas came back as soon as a row was instantiated. Um, oh, I don't know why this didn't run. I was, I was testing it. I didn't actually add a list row here. Uh, so here, I'm going to delete this again and then rerun this one. Okay, so I have no data body range. I'm just going to put an if then in here. So, data by range is not nothing. It is nothing. So it's going to add a list row. You can see the calculated columns then come back where they're not there if the data by range is nothing. I'll step through this one again, and it says, okay, the data by range is something. It's not is nothing. So then it deletes it again, and you see those calculated columns went away. As soon as I type on the worksheet. Uh, it'll come back, or if I instantiate a row, then those those uh, formulas come back. So an, an important test to know is uh, if the data body range is nothing. Now, uh, the interesting thing about uh, adding a list row, two two things to really note. First of all, you can only add, using this method, you can only add one row at a time, which is just stupid. Uh, it's stupid because I'll tell you why. So if you want to add, uh, let's say you you know you want to add ten rows, or let's just say you want to add twelve rows. You got you know you want you have twelve rows of uh, things to add. Maybe you're do adding you know a value per month, uh, and you want to add twelve rows. So you can't say you know list rows uh, you know like twelve dot add or or the, there's no actual uh, parameter you can specify that says add this many rows. You would actually have to do 
this same action 12 times. Now, that's, uh, that's a workaround. That's a way to do it. The downside is uh, after, after doing so many list rows.add or even list columns.add is this will really slow down after a while. Um, it will become absolutely dog slow and is really just kind of a pain in the butt. So uh, there are other methods to, to increase rows or columns by uh, more than one at a time. And those, those workarounds get pretty tricky. Uh, there are some examples in here that I will get to uh, in the class module. Uh, but I do have a couple examples uh, somewhere in here, right here. Okay, so uh, I have some of these, I have uh, insert columns and insert rows routines. Uh, these are also uh, in the class module. Actually, I think I only have the insert rows in the class module, uh, but it's the same basic premise. So basically what this does is this routine, uh, here, here's a test that calls this, this test routine. Uh, I'm gonna do the rows first. Uh, so first of all, when you, when you call this routine, it's got uh, two optional parameters. You specify the row index and the row count. Uh, the row index is uh, the, the row where you want to start adding below, and then the row count is how many rows you want to insert. And you see I have the default value is just one for that, so we'll just insert one row uh, by default. So basically, uh, what this says is you, you're setting uh, the list object variable Right, you can set this to, to whatever you want. So if it's a specific worksheet, you know, right, dot list object, you know, door table name here, right? And it wouldn't contain spaces. Right. Uh, uh, so there's a test in here, if data bar range is nothing, we instantiate a single row. Right, so there's there's at least one row there, uh, because if we check the list rows or the data body range, if the data body range is nothing, this will bomb. So we have to instantiate at least one row, uh, and then there's a check for this the row index that was passed. Uh, if it wasn't passed, since it's optional, then we set the row index equals the last row of the table, which if the data body range was nothing, we know it's one because we only added one row. But if we have copious amounts of data, say we have 50 rows or 100 rows or 1,000 rows, then this is going to return the, the count of the list rows, so the last row number of the table, not of the worksheet. If it was passed, we want to make sure they didn't go past the last row of the table. So we just say of that row index or the last row in the table. Uh, so we just do a little error checking. And then if they pass a negative number, uh, you know, we'll just, we just throw in a tech, uh, test after that to say, okay, so less than or equal to zero, then exit. And they're long, so it's got to be a, a whole number. Uh, so basically, there's two actions here. So the first is we take, uh, we say, take the table and take the list rows of the row index. We offset by one row, so we take the specified row. We go run one row below that. We resize that range, the number of row count that was passed, which if left by default is one, and as we, we just use the, uh, the insert method. Now, uh, if, that's the, if it's the last row of the table, it actually won't get inserted, so if this table is, it has one list row. And if I run this routine and I end it after this line, this insert line, the table's not gonna change sizes because that's like saying, um, you know, passing the row index of, will be one, row count will be one, so it's going to come to the, the last row in the table, go down, offset by one row, resize by the number of rows that I tell it to, let's just say I tell it to five rows, and then it's going to insert here, you know, so if I, you know, right click, insert, shift cells down, okay, now, well, guess what, <laughs> the table didn't expand, it just took these rows and inserted them down. So. We, we do a test to say, okay, if the row index is indeed passes the last row of the table, then resize the table to be the size of that row count, the, the, 
the, the range of the rows plus that row count. So we actually have to resize if it's below the last row of the table. So basically the action is, uh, is twofold. So first is insert uh, by that data body range uh, resized, that you know, X rows, and if it's the last row, we actually have to, to resize the table itself, which would be like on the design tab, clicking resize table, and coming down, you know, five rows or however many rows. So uh, to illustrate my point, I'm going to delete the data by range of the table, and uh, I've got this uh, routine that's going to test this insert table row. Uh, and I'm just passing two and four, so the row index is two, which is actually not legal in this table, all right? Because there's a, technically there's zero list rows, so it's gonna it's gonna use this line and it's gonna add a row and it's gonna use one as its uh, its index. And then I'm saying increase by four rows. So I'm just gonna use F8 to step through this. So you see my row index was passed as two, row count is four, data by range is indeed nothing. It's going to add a list row. You can see the formulas come back. So it has one list row instantiated. The data bar range is not nothing now. And I do my, my row index test. I pass a number, but it's going to take the minimum of the, the variable passed and the list rows count, which you can see is one. So the row index is now one. So I've got an appropriate row index. And I'm saying take that row, offset by one, resize by four, insert down, that row index is number one. It does indeed equal the number of list rows, so I need to resize my table, and it resized it to the appropriate range. So I, I resized it by the number of rows, which was increased by this row count variable, and then I kept the uh, columns by the number of columns that are actually in the table. So table uh, dot range dot columns count, or you could say table dot list columns dot count. Um, and this one could have been table dot list rows dot count, right? Uh, the only thing, no, yeah, I'll stick with that. So, uh, so this is uh, one nice routine to insert multiple rows in a table. So there's no default way to do it. So this is uh, you know what I use, and it's basically the same same premise for the columns, you know. But we're we're doing the column test. Uh, you know, make sure the column index variable that was passed is, you know, good. It's not over the number of columns total. It's not a negative number. Uh, we resize. We do not pass the rows. We pass uh, the column variable. And then we, uh, in the resize, if it was the last column, we keep the rows the same. And then the column is increased by the column count variable. So this is uh, just two examples of how to increase rows and columns by uh, more than one row or column, which is not available by default. Um, and this is in the M insert module. Uh, but uh, please feel free to, like I said, if you want to download this workbook, um, uh, you know, you know, feel free to use uh, any and all of this code as you see fit. And I, I certainly hope it helps. Uh, deleting, uh, we've covered deleting a little bit. Uh, so here's an example of deleting the table body. Uh, it's it you know we do the test if it's not nothing then delete it, and then at the end we I add a list row so I always instantiate that that data body range because uh, it's just it's usually not a good idea to just leave it as nothing. So uh, anytime you actually delete the data body range, uh, instantiate it. So now one method that uh, can be used commonly when deleting it uh, when such as, say we're returning a query to it, we're, say we're just doing a cross-tab query, right, because we're using VBA. So you delete the table body range, and when you want to return it, you know, so you uh, you could do, uh, uh, let's just say, oops. I'm just going to specify this. Uh, Range here. And I'm going to say table dot hetero range one one. So that's just going to say this range object variable is going to be the top leftmost, you know, row one, column one of the hetero range, which we know can only always be one one row, uh, but it could be you know x number of columns or n number of columns. So the downside of, of using this is 
uh, actually it would be uh, offset one row. So we're going to go down one row. So we want to get this top left uh, header row cell and come down one and use whatever cell that is, regardless of whether the, the data body range is instantiated or not. The downside with this, if you don't have the header row showing, this is going to bomb because there is no header row range. It's, it's just it's nothing. Right. So before this, you actually have to make sure that the header row is showing. So the way I do this is I just set um, a variable, you know, as boolean, and then I set it table not show headers. So I've captured that, and then I want to say table show headers equals true. Force it. Uh, use you know set that object. Uh, and then at any point after this, if you don't want to show it, you could say table show headers equals your variable header showing. And that's just going to return to the same state that it was at before you ran your routine. And then you'd say, you know, ret, um, you know, you get your hot from record set or, you know, however you want to, however you want to return that value, but you've got that range object now. So the header row range, the total row range, the data body range, um, you know, test. You know, setting a test for these, uh, you know, like this for the header and and vice versa with the totals, uh, and testing for the data by range is nothing. Uh, it's pretty much going to be paramount to working with tables and VBA. Uh, so it, the downside is it ends up with you know you end up writing a little more, uh, quite a bit more code, but it ends up being uh, pretty robust. And you know, if you can work it with, for example, like the insert uh, rows and columns where you're you're doing multiple things at once. Uh, it's gonna uh, it's gonna work pretty fast. Like we like I said last week, the de one of the downsides with tables is you want to do things in bulk with tables because when you interact with a, a list object, the whole table will re recalculate. Uh, it's kind of one of the, the fundamentals of the um, the XML basis of the, the the list object, the tables, is a change to a table recalculates the entire table. So uh, on large tables with with just copious amounts of uh, calculations can become uh, painfully slow. So you know you want to make sure your formulas are nice and robust and, and efficient. Um, but that is a topic for another time, so I don't want to really touch that right now. Suffice to say that uh, you know calculation efficiency can be an issue with large tables. Uh, okay, so I just want to go over. A a few loops here, and then I want to cover this class module, how to, how to work uh, uh, a tables class module real quick. So there's there's a few ways to loop, uh, and I've, I've got some examples for looping through uh, rows and columns here. So it, I this is a looping through the sheet columns. So you can see on this on this worksheet, uh, I almost always have a, just a blank column uh, to the left of things. So the t table column actually starts in column two and goes to column I, uh, was it column nine? So uh, if you want to loop through the columns using the, the, the worksheet, which this is an example using the uh, worksheet object, you need to actually find where the first column is and last column is on the sheet. So basically what this does is this uses two variables, uh, column start, column end. And I'm just, I, I, I used a couple of functions here uh, to return what that first column was and what that last column was. Uh, and those are, where are those? Uh, here's a little trick if no one doesn't know it. Uh, you know, right click or uh, Shift F2 uh, and go to definition. We'll take you to that routine. So here's the first column and last column routines and basically this says, uh, it passes a, a, a list object and it says take the intersect of the first list column range and the cells of the worksheet, so the parent of the table object is worksheet. Uh, so get the intersect of that and return the column. And then the last column is just uh, taking the list columns object and using the list columns count and the same premise. Take the intersect of that and the worksheet behind it and return the column. So return the column of the worksheet itself. So this will return two, this will return nine. Um, actually, I'm not using the header row for anything, so I can actually get rid of that. Um, and then I, I just use a, you know, a for next loop to say you know, for column step equals column start to column end, 
by default, you don't have to say it, but it, you know, this step is one. Uh, you know, the increment is one uh, every iteration in this loop. And I'm just going to debug uh, to the immediate window and set the value of the, the, the sheet, which is variable of the active sheet, and using the cells object, say header row column step. Uh, oh, you know what? I am using the header row. That's right. <laughs> Oopsie. Okay. So if I step through this, um, I don't want to run this. So I'm going to hit Shift F8 to step over. If I didn't, for example, if I hit F8, it's going to take me to that routine. So Shift F8 will step over. And column start you can see is two. Column end is nine. Header row is five. Again, I didn't put a test in here to test if the header row was showing, so this is banking on uh, the header row always showing. Uh, you know, to, to really write bulletproof code, there's, there's going to be a whole lot more code doing tests like we were showing earlier. And then here's my loop. So the header row is 5, column step is 2, which should be order date, region, rep, and I'm just going to hit F5 to run through all these, and you can see uh, just printed all of these to the immediate window. So that's using uh, the the worksheet itself. So like I'm using this, the cells object of the worksheet, but I'm I'm using the uh, the column values uh, where I f I found them on the worksheet. Now, if you want to use the uh, the table columns themselves and not the worksheet, uh, here's a table loops for columns. So in here, the index uh, start is one. The last one is the the count of the list columns, and this is usually the way I do it. The nice thing about doing it this way is it doesn't matter where on the worksheet a table is, and that's one of the great things about tables, right, is they can be anywhere, and they are dynamic unto themselves because they have their own objects, members, and methods. And so I'm just going to loop from, you know, column start to column end, and I'm just going to use the list columns object and say, give me the name of that, that list column, which is the, the header value, right? So you can do, uh, so uh, the index would be the you know the index number, so order date is one, region is two, rep is three, etc. The name, uh, uh, you know, there's the the total totals calculation. If you want the the formulas in the total row, there's lots of things that you can do. I'm just going to use the name and run this, and you can see it returns the same values. So it's basically doing the same thing, but using uh, more of the uh, list object and its its uh, child numbers. Uh, here's another example, but it returns the index colon table name or table column name because it's using the list column to loop through the list columns. So I'm saying for each table column, which is a list column object in my table dot list column. So I'm actually using list columns object. When I run this, the, I, I get the same thing when I'm just adding a, you know, the index and then the name. So there's three examples of, of how to loop through a list column. The list rows, uh, you know, here's an example for top down. The next example is bottom up, but it basically uses the same premise. Uh, but instead of list columns, we're using list rows. Again, this has no test to see if the data body range is nothing. Uh, bottom up is basically the same thing, but I'm stepping minus one going from the end to the start. Same problem with the list rows. If you deleted the data body range, this is going to bomb. Uh, and here's using the list row, like we use the list column above. You can loop through all of the list rows. Um, and since there's no name to a list row, I'm just returning the index. So if I run this, you can see there's five five rows, and I just gave you the index of each row. So you can do different things if you you know if you want to manipulate the data body range of that table. Um, you know, just use the the range object, and it's giving you the range of that table. So this the uh, the range of this list row is going to be from B7 to I7. So and that's that's one way to, to work with uh, list rows. Okay, I know I'm short on time, uh, but uh, just to quickly kind of go over this class, so there's there's really only one property. We just set the table, and then I've got some, uh, some methods in here that uh, are not easily available uh, from native Excel. But uh, so I have routines on here to, to clear the body, which you know does these tests. Uh, if it's not nothing, delete it. Uh, by default, uh, we have this initialized first row variable that's uh, true if it is. We add a row, uh, otherwise we don't. Uh, clearing the filters, uh, 
uh, we're just looping through here and saying uh, take away the auto filter for that field because we pass no criteria. We just um, uh, so this just easily clears all filters from all columns. Uh, this export to Excel, uh, there's basically what it does is it, it takes this table and it copies it to a brand new workbook. Uh, so and there's some some settings you can pass. You can specify the table name, whether you want it to stay the same, whether you want the sheet name to stay the same. Basically, it takes this table, it copies it to a new worksheet, um, and then you can uh, force the headers visible, force the totals visible. Otherwise, it will uh, keep what is previously there in the, in the, the source table. Uh, copy style is copies a, a table style from one workbook to another, and if it's a closed workbook, it will open it. Uh, if the file is not open when this runs, uh, it uh, so it sets it to a, a variable. Uh, and there's this little uh, function is workbook open to test it. If it was not open, it will close it when it's done, saving the changes. Uh, if it's uh, if it's not a file, if it's uh, a a, a uh, what was the other one? Um, if it's another open workbook, so you can either pass uh, a workbook object or uh, a path to an existing workbook. So the file is open, just pass the workbook object itself. So uh, oh, I'm in the class module. So um, so the class test. I've got. Uh, Okay, so here's a good example of how to uh, initialize it. So we, we initialize a variable as our class name. Then we set that variable to equal a new class because we've, we've created our own object, right? It's this called C table. So it's a C table object. Uh, you could write dim my table as new C table. Uh, it's, and then get rid of this line. Um, the downside is every time you access this object, it's going to try and test if it's if it's a new object or not. So this is just the way I I do things. Uh, you know, declare it and then set it, uh, and then you just need to instantiate the uh, the table property we have here and set it to your whatever table you want. And then and you could say my table dot, and you have access to all of those. Um, methods and functions that you have uh, in that class. So this one is copying style and it's just saying uh, I'm passing a, a workbook object. This would ha obviously have to be open. Um, I think I've got a routine in there to check if it's open or not. Uh, but uh, So this is this is a way to, to use a class module for uh, and it's using you know all the list object uh, members for so here's like insert rows uh, so here's you know you can use a you want to insert multiple rows uh, you know insert rows and then you can say count uh, you know what's the count and you know above what row uh, so this one is it's a little different than the the insert routine in the the insert uh, standard module uh, but it basically works the same way. So there's quite a few examples in here. So like print table, uh, here's an example of uh, uh, you know just using this as part of a class. Uh, copy table is kind of an interesting one. It will uh, update uh, one table from another. So where that is good is if you have um, you know like a, a settings table. Um, Right. Um, let's just say we have a table here, and give it a style. Um, zero and something else. Seven. Right. So if you you have a, a, a table that's settings, right? I'm just going to call this. Setting start, settings current, and uh, you know this gets updated to you know wherever you want. You want to you want to go back to like a uh, uh, your default settings. You know, so this this copy table would uh, basically what it does is you uh, 
error. I've been in this update file test. So I say, um, oh, I've got the same example as uh, sample data two. So um, these are these two tables are identical except for this region. I've got one is central, one is east. And what I've done is I've said um, I've set this table uh, class object to this sample 2.2, which is this table, this top table. And I'm saying uh, copy the table where the source is sample 2.1, right? So when I run this, you can see it changed the region from central on the stop table to the what I specified as the source table. So basically updated, it took this table, which would be my current table, with my original table, and it just updated all values. It skips calculated columns. Uh, so if any calculations are different, uh, you know, it, it won't touch those right now. So you can add as many calculated columns as you want. Um, so for example, if you want to manipulate data, you want to work with it, and then you want to start over from scratch, if you have a copy of that table, this is just one easy way uh, to do that is by using this, this copy table method. All right, so uh, I know I don't have time to go over the rest of these. These are available in the uh, this sample file that is going to be available for download. Um, I, don't even, I don't even know if anyone is still with me. <laughs> okay, so it looks like I still got much of you. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, you still have a good audience. So this file will be uploaded hopefully later today to the webinar page. And I'm also going to upload the video uh, prior to Monday to the video page. And if people have any questions, they could reach out to Zach directly, either through VBA Express or through uh, Zach at ExcelAnAccess.com or what other email address, Zach? Um, or Zach at ExcelTables.com. E either one of those, yeah. Oh, yes. And if you haven't checked out ExcelTables.com, check it out. It's a new website for Zach and uh, Kevin Jones on their book and on Excel Tables. And if anyone has any questions, uh, you know, let me know. Shoot them in the uh, – uh, actually, I don't know how to ask questions on here. There's a, there should be an area in the, the control – go to webinar control panel for you to ask questions. Uh, so I hope this was – uh, helpful in any way. I know uh, it can be seem a little advanced uh, working with list objects because they're, uh, you know, they're they're not well known, uh, but they can be super powerful. And if you if you learn the little things and little pitfalls, uh, like you know the data body range equal nothing and etc., uh, they can be really powerful and and really fast with your data. Uh, there is in in the book, I'm, I'm going to try and get some uh, some parts of the book online, and there, I'll be making part of these uh, available on a, a blog post on the exceltables.com also. Uh, but there's a whole chapter de dedicated to uh, VBA that uh, most of it was written by uh, Kevin Jones. Uh, he kind of spearheaded that chapter, but um, covers a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, working with uh, you know SQL Server, getting a, a access cross tab query. There's an example in there. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of good examples, and it really kind of illustrates. It's the VBA chapter is is actually more like a help file chapter than anything else, and it, it hopefully I think we we covered all the pitfalls. Um, but uh, so, like I said, thank you very much for your time. I I really appreciate you spending this this time with me, kind of sticking out an extra ten minutes or so. And one more announcement: next week we're doing part one of pivot tables. And that's at the same time, 11 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, and that's with uh, Dennis Taylor. And then the following week, we're doing part two. So those are the next two webinars. And we appreciate everyone attending the webinar today and the one last week with Zach Barisi. Have a great weekend, everybody.